Okay, all right. I know everyone's energy is low, so we're the last ones. So I'm going to walk you through a 50 slide with words on it only. Oh, yeah. Okay, good. All right. So I just want to make sure everyone's paying attention. To be perfectly honest with you, I'm, I, this this topic excites me a lot. So, I'm, but because of the time constraints and because I much, I think you much prefer rather see a demo, I'm going to move through the slides very quickly. Um, if you have any questions, so or we'll share the slides with you, so you can go back and read the slides word for word. Um, and if I start going on a tangent, tell me to stop because uh, I want you to get to the demo. So really quickly, we're jumping in, right? We have the level set. We have to make sure when we're talking about event-driven automation, we all have the same definition, right? Um, event-driven automation. I used to use the term auto remediation back in 2015 when I thought this was very necessary. So now fast forward to now, right? We finally got it. Yes. Yay. Woo. All right. It's just the idea of being able to take intelligence analytics, right, and be able to go and take those service requests and, and really make an end-to-end -end IT solution, right? You have a problem, something fails, you can check, uh, put some rules in place to determine what it should do next, have it do that thing, Bob's your uncle, you're still asleep, and all is well, right? That's what event-driven uh, automation is. Uh, we very much needed it. Um, see this as the next level, and that's why next level of automation is highlighted, right? Um, you know, there's different levels of, of automation maturity, um, and if you want to have a deep conversation about that, I would love to do that as well, right? So everyone starts out kind of that the beginning phase, infancy phase, uh, right? You're just doing tasks, specific tasks, right? Solving for things for a specific task, and then you move into the point where you begin to do end-to-end -end workflows and really begin to orchestrate. Right? And then once you get that down, you can move into the next phase, which is when you begin to innovate with automation. And this is it, right? This is, this is your next step in how you'll be able to innovate with automation, um, being able to make decisions, um, you know, implement event-driven automation within your multiple IT use cases, all the great stuff, right? So this is, the, this is what you're aiming towards, right? So I don't know uh, where you are in your organizations now as far as where you are in your maturity uh, or in your journey of automation. But the goal is to get to the point where automation is solving your problems and you don't want to touch it at all, right? Um, I'm not going to spend time with this slide. This slide basically says the more people you have involved to fix a problem, the longer it takes, the more money you lose, right? That's, that's just how problems work. And if you go, if I had to reflect back on my days as an infrastructure admin, I could tell a very quick story. Um, so I, I was uh, the lead admin for um, uh, our website, right? I work for an uh, airline, right? Our website, our booking flow, our check-in flow, right? And if you've ever worked for anyone that ever worked for an airline, you'll know that the way you make your money is through your booking flow, right? People do not go to the airport and buy tickets anymore, right? They go online and they buy their tickets. When they get to the airport, when they check in, they go to a kiosk. Guess what? That's web-driven. So those platforms are really important. One night, they decided to push a change to our booking flow and forgot the step of clearing out the CDN, right? The CDN caches all of the images and things, and they forgot to clear it. And so at 2 a.m., they're waking me up telling me the website is, not, is, is down, that, you know, that people can't finish the booking flow. It was something as simple as going into at, my, uh, at the time and hitting one button that just says clear the cache that fixed the problem. Now, they were down for an hour. I don't know how much money they lost in that hour, but that's how much, you know, they lost money in that hour, right? Back in the days, this is what you would experience. But now fast forward now until the time where you can go into some auto remediation, right? If I had event-driven automation at the time, I would have that, that step of refreshing that cache part of a, a rule set, right? If this thing is failing, go in and reset this cache and then check its status at the end, right? So that's the whole idea around event-driven automation, being able to observe a problem that could possibly happen, put in the criteria to be able to evaluate what you should do when you see that problem, and then take it to the next step, which is act, right? Actually do something. Um, you, you know, a lot of us have gotten to the step of observing and evaluating, right? And then you raise a ticket and say, someone needs to go and look at this, right? That's fine, that's, that's, that's getting you in that direction. But take it over the final hurdle, right, where you can actually automate the acting part. And I will be clear, this is work, right? Event-driven automation is not easy. Why? Because you have to now take all of the intelligence that's in your brains, right, the things that you do every day, and actually make code out of it, right? So I don't want to make this sound like this is like easy peasy. 
It does take a time investment, but once you do that time investment, it's absolutely, very, absolutely worth it. I know I'm getting wordy. All right, I'm moving along. Um, one thing we just wanted to emphasize is that event-driven automation is use case friendly, right? It covers the broad spectrum of all things that you can touch within the Ansible world, right? We're talking about networking, we're talking about traditional infrastructure, we're talking about cloud, um, we're talking about security applications, right? There is no limit to how you can apply that event-driven automation, and this is the power behind um, uh, what we're bringing with the, uh, this new uh, capability. Um, uh, Ansible rule books is, is the new term, right? So we have playbooks, we have roles, now we got rule books, right? Just add one more book to the, to the flavor here. It's broken down into three different areas, right? You define your source, you define your rules, you define your actions. It's that simple. Um, and uh, sorry, again, I am talking fast, I'm moving fast, I'm doing that on purpose, because I want you to get to the demo, so I apologize for that. Some of y'all looking at me like, I don't even understand what he's talking about right now. Uh, <laughs> I promise you it's worth it at the end. Um, this is just an example of what that flow should look like or could look like for you, right? You have your event sources, right? So we have some fun ones there. Dynatrace is the one that always stands out to me because I, I, I have a, a good experience with them from being an application monitoring tool. Uh, imagine that sends off some sort of alert saying that there's some sort of failure. Uh, you then have your event-driven uh, Ansible, right, to be able to check for that for that particular failure and then tell it what to do to be able to resolve it, right? So sources, rules actions. Um, so this is just a good working example of what an Ansible rulebook looks like. Of course it is a YAML structure, right? We, we wouldn't uh, be Ansible if we went in a different direction. So if you know how to write YAML, you know how to write a playbook, you know how to write a role, you can write a rulebook, right? That's the, the first thing that's fantastic about it. Um, um, yeah, I'll just leave it there. This is a good, this is an example of what it looks like. Um, it, one thing to, 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 to call out, and I think it calls out later, is that when you execute your rule book, it's something that's constantly running and watching for that event to occur, right? So it's not like an Ansible playbook. When you execute it, it runs and then it stops. Rule books actually behave a little bit differently. Um, and I think we go, oh, I, look, I jumped the gun. This is, uh, this is it kind of talking about it, right? So it's, it's, it's the idea that it's running and it will look to meet, to see if you meet a certain condition and when it does meet that certain condition, it will actually take an action. Um, well, yeah, this, this kind of this doubles down on what I was mentioning, right? So versus an Ansible playbook, when you execute it, it runs, it does something and it stops. In Ansible rule books, once you execute it, it will wait for the event. And when that event occurs, it then decides if it meets the criteria or not. If it doesn't, nothing happens. If it does, it performs an action, and then it goes back to the again of waiting for that event, right? So it's a little bit of a different behavior from a playbook. We just wanted to highlight that so that you were aware of that behavior was gonna be a little bit different. All of the events, uh, source plugins and integrations are here. Um, there's a long roadmap of, uh, of additional source plugins that are going to be available. Um, there was actually a blog that was written uh, today um, that was put out there about writing your own source plugin. So just take a look at that. That was hot off the press and literally just came out today. Um, but there will be more to come from that, uh, more information around how to create your own event source plugins. And so with that being said, we're going to jump into the demo. ridiculous with this thing. All right. So hopefully it works. Uh, the demo I'm going to use it is going to use Instruct. If you are familiar with Catacoda, it's a very similar workshop environment thing. So what we're going to do for this demo, we're going to do a KTOPS demo. So uh, we have a web application stored in a, a Git repository, and we want to basically do continuous deployment based on pull requests, or merges into main, that kind of thing. So first off, we have here our GT instance, right? So we sign in as a student with a password. There, Ansible. <coughs> and now what we're going to do, we're going to import a repository from GitHub, right? 
So this is the clone media hub. We click on my grape. Right. So now we have it. Right? So what we're gonna need now, we're gonna need to um, create a webhook. Uh, so when things happen into the repository, we can send events to somewhere, right? So we go to settings, and we go to um, webhooks. We can add a webhook. Git, we're going to add here. Our endpoint is going to be a post. We're going to select custom events because we don't have, want everything. So we want to have like a push events and we want to have pull request events. Okay. We want to filter by branch. So we're going to set here main. We're going to want to react to all kinds of branches. We add a webhook. So now we have it. Now if we um, click on it, we can actually test the delivery. Um, we can click on this delivery. Obviously, it's not going to do um, anything that is interesting because uh, there's nothing listening to where it's sending the webhook. But at least you know we can uh, see that you know Giti is actually like sending something. So we get here, right? Now the next part. If we go to the editor, right, and we have here in our project, we have webview.yaml, this is actually a role book. So in this example, what it's going to do is basically it defines the, the event source plugin. In this case, it's the EDA webhook. So basically, we're saying, hey, we want to receive webhook things on port 5000 and run some filters on the things that comes. And in this case, we're just you know converting dashes to underscores. And they, uh, once we get those events, we can uh, define rules that, uh, you know, we can put some criteria on the event coming in, and depending on that, we can actually do an action if there's a match for the rule. In this case, the condition is event payload is defined, basically says, okay, did we get anything as a payload? And if it's defined, then, you know, we want to print out some debug thing. So, now. We need to run as a robot. Okay, so as you can see, you know, it's blinking because it's listening to things. As Walter said, you know, it's not something as sensible playbook that does its thing and finishes. It's going to continuously listen for events depending on you know the event sources and. and Robux that you put. Now, if we go to the Kitty repository, and we go again to settings, we go to webhooks. Now, if we click on the webhook, and we do another test delivery, hopefully, look at this. So, as a rulebook, you know, got the event from the webhook, and you know, the condition of the rule was, uh, is there anything as the payload? And because there's anything, it's defined, it basically prints out everything. Okay, so now we, we move on next. We're going to do maybe something more interesting. So we're going to modify our webhook.yaml. So as you can see, we now have another webhook. So it's going to do more interesting thing rather than instead of just you know debugging things. So again, we have the our event source plugin, uh, EDA webhook, which is listening on four five thousand. Now we have another feature. So we're not going to put as part of the. Um, we're going to you know basically the sender and the owner, um, you know from the event. And we're going to, again, you know, convert uh, the dashes to underscores. Now, as part of the rules, what we're going to do, we're going to get the, the push event details. So uh, the condition is, is this really a push event? And if so, 
create a new event that just contains these uh, fields. Type, git ref, repo name, author, clone URL, right? And then, you know, it creates yet another event, which is going to maybe be captured uh, by the respond to push events rule. Because the condition is, if the event repo name is the EDA app and the event type is push, Rather than debugging, uh, this time I want you to play, uh, run a playbook that is called unpush. Okay? And after that, uh, we can you know, continue the, the chain of events. That's why you know, I have the post events true, so it can move on to the next one. Uh, run the playbook for doing the deploy. So, we need to run rollbook with this new thing, with this new Rollbook. Now uh, we run it with verbo, so it just uh, of a blinking cursor we see something. Now if we go to the project repository and we go to the deploy, let's try to modify directly in the editor and change something, and let's see if that's going to trigger something on EDA. What we what basically what we want. So, as an example, so we have here a, a, um, one of the bars is a color, right? So, this is how we're at. This is not deployed yet. Uh, the color of our, our app is green, right? So, let's say that, you know, we want to have something like red. We commit the changes. Let's see, you know, something happens from Rubo. Yeah, so it picked up the event. It's matching the rules based up on the event. And depending on the conditions, it's going to run the playbooks that we put as part of the action. So what it's doing is basically do, uh, deploying the application because it, it matches, you know, the, the rule, basically. So once, you know, it's done the deploy, hopefully if we go to the app tab, there you go. So we have a web app in color red. Now, if we go back, Imagine that, you know, I don't like, you know, red. You know, I really like, you know, ANSI blue. ANSI blue. So, if now I go and I commit the changes on main. Yep, got picked up once again from EDA. Matching the rule, so it's going to run the action to for deploying the application. So once the playbook, you know, is done for our app with our change, hopefully if we go to the app tab and we refresh it, it's red, but then if we refresh it, it's anti blue. Yeah. Nice. So if we go to the terminal and we cut it, go to the next. So this is like, you know, pushing it straight to main. How about, you know, if we wanted to have like a, a test environment in which, you know, our pull request gets deployed and once, you know, we are fine with it, then, you know, we can merge back into main and that gets deployed to our production environment, right? Let's try that out. So we, if we go to webhub, so that's basically it. So we have our, our rule for main event, but we also have a rule for when there's a pull request pushed. And depending on that kind of event, it's going to deploy either to the test environment or to the production environment. So if we go to the EDA tab again, we can copy and paste. Again, the repose is going to listen to our events. Now, if we go to our Giti, right, and I open Deploy, right, I'm going to edit. And this time, I'm going to use, I don't know, maybe green, okay? But instead of just pushing down to main, you know, I'm just going to create a new branch and create a pull request out of it. So I propose a file change, new pull request, update deploy, create pull request, 
We go to the EDA tab. Oh, it picked it up. So there was a pull request event. It's going to check the condition, and depending on that, it's going to run action, which is deploying to our development environment. So hopefully, if we go to our developer environment, wait. So if we go to Giti and we merge the PR, hopefully this would appear in our in our product, right? Right now, it's it blue. Our dev environment is green. So you know we are we are okay with green. We want to have it, you know, in production. So in Giti, we create the merge commit from the pull request. Now we go back to the terminal, picked up. There was a push into main, so now it's going to react to it depending on the condition. It's going to run you know, the pertinent playbook to deploy to prod. So it's running the associated playbook to the action. So if we go to the prod tab and we refresh, hopefully it's green. So we just move to prod. And this is the end of the demo. I really hope you like it. I think that, you know, I'm super excited about DDA because I really think you know, it opens a whole new world of capabilities. Um, I like think of it, right? Imagine there's a, a right now an alert manager event source plugin, right? And you have, you know, your applications in VMs, for example, right? You could have an alert manager sending events for, you know, depending on load. So when, you know, the, the load goes up, you can actually hook the, that up from EDA to do a playbook to scale out and by the same token scale in so basically you're having you know kubernetes you know with this thing and you know apart from that i mean think of it like for example i'm very excited about um networking use cases uh, i know uh, my colleague nuno martis who's uh, in technical marketing i encourage you that you go to the blog for eda because they're pushing a whole ton of really cool demos so they push a, a, a demo uh, about Arista, which they're working on a bed sort plugin, so they can actually uh, react to things that are happening on a networking device and hook it up to a playbook so you can actually push changes to the devices based on those events. And that's it. I'm going to hand over. So now. Now he has to stand next to me since he has the pack and I have the mic, so this is uh, this is gonna be weird. Um, so yeah, so just wanted to close out. I know that everyone has uh, had a long day. Uh, this is the roadmap that we have in mind around EDA, right? So it was announced at Fest, great. 2023. Now we're in New Year. Um, they're expecting to integrate it into um, AAP 2.4 and 2.5, right? So that's on the the roadmap of uh, soon coming. Um, and there, there's, a, yet again, I'm showing a slide with a whole bunch of links that you cannot get to. Um, so, yeah, so, uh, yeah, yeah, anyway. Um, so I will also put these links out there on uh, Matrix as well, and I'll let you know when they're out there so that you can uh, take a look. Again, there is a self-paced lab for this as well. Um, and, of course, a GitHub repository already going with uh, a few uh, rule books in it. Um, in case you were interested in getting started with it, this is some very quick instructions to be able to how to jump into getting started. Uh, whether you're going to do PIP or you're going to do it from Galaxy, um, you want to take a screenshot of this so that you can maybe refer to it later and, and give it a go in your own lab. That would be great. And outside of that, we just want to thank you for your time as always. Definitely give it a try. Let us know how you like it. If you don't like it, what you like about it, what you hate about it, you know, we want to hear your feedback. Please do that. But other than that, um, thank you. Cool. Any questions? Uh, oh, sorry. Question part. Man, I almost thought I would got out of that. All right, that's fine. <laughs> now go for it. I'm just kidding. Um, so in the demo, we've seen Ansible Rulebook running in the foreground, you know, in the CLI. 
how how do you expect yeah. how do you how do you expect that to work in production? Are you would you run system D services with Ansible rulebooks? Would you run one? Would you run five, ten, fifty? How how would that work in practice? Well, I, I have my thoughts, and then you, yeah, you, you, you just yeah. repeat the question for that. Oh, so so basically, the question is is what I guess. What's the expectation around how you should run the, the rule book since the fact of the matter is is that it, 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 it runs, it, yeah, it just kind of runs in a window, right? So as it, kind of during the demo you saw how when you executed it, it just sat in the window and the window was just waiting for the next response. Um, the, the, my understanding is that when this, was, so this is an early launch of it, right? And this is, this is why it's being put out to the community. We want you to give it a try and see how you like it. The whole idea is that this is to be directly integrated into AAP and, in, and, and assuming will be integrated and be able to be integrated in AWX, right? If you spend the time to do that. And that because it, once it does get integrated, you won't have to worry about having a, a command window open and it kind of turning and waiting for an event to occur. Uh, but I do understand your point uh, very vividly. Um, and I don't really have a direct answer. Maybe you have a, 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 a answer or thoughts around that. Yep. Okay. Just holding out to use your probe. Ah, yeah. <laughs> so right now, so uh, my understanding, this has been you know been pushed you know um, you know to the community so we can basically get uh, sorry so we can basically get you know early feedback, but. There's currently a development to have like a, a server side of things for the DA. So you can expect there's going to be pretty much a very similar architecture to how AWX controller works today, to how EDA is going to work. So we're going to have like uh, basically a, a, a robot um, um, orchestrator that is going to basically spin up rule books as you saw in foreground, depending on the, you know the activations of events. So it's going to be pretty similar to controller right now. Okay. Great question. What kind of <clears throat> what kind of rules do you support? Uh, what kind of source do you support right now? And uh, if there, if there is any roadmap or plan to support legacy stuff like C slug attacks and MP trap? Yeah, uh, the question is, uh, was uh, uh, what are the event source plugins that we have currently, and what are the roadmap? So this is what we uh, what Walter showed on the um, one of the slides. So right now we have webhooks, we have uh, Prometheus Alert Manager, Kafka, Azure Service Bus. Uh, you can also watch for file changes in servers, uh, range, which is you know basically just a, a demo kind of event source plugin. And then definitely, you know, there's going to be a big play, you know, from from partners. Uh, I know that, you know, besides the ones that you're seeing there, you know, I know that the Rista, you know, the network inside, they're developing their own. So I can foresee the network inventors are going to jump on this, because I, I personally think this is going to be a great use case for networking. Cool. Next question. Yes, so actually... So the question is... Yeah. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, sorry. So the question was if this is tied to execution environment, right? Yeah, so there's going to be like a, a mapping for where you want to run. So there will be an action. Right now here, I'm, I'm, and we're showing like run playbook, which runs Ansible Runner. To, uh, so Ansible Runner, you can actually pass an execution environment. But there's also another action type, which you can basically run a job template which has as an execution environment tied in. Any more questions? Cool, well thank you very much both of you, it's been a great talk. Okay.